Tenakoto Katoa, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joel Colon Rios. I am a professor of, of law at Victoria University of Wellington and director of the New Zealand Center for Public Law. It is great to see you all here, even if only virtually. For more than a decade, the New Zealand Center for Public Law has hosted a series of, of lectures by national and, and international public office holders designed to make the work of important public actors more accessible. Today, we are honored to host Peter Boschier, the chief ombudsman for New Zealand. Peter was born and educated in Gisborne, Gisborne and later attended Teherenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, obtaining a Bachelor of Laws with honors in 1975. He was appointed chief ombudsman in December 2015, following a distinguished career as a judge, and in May 2020 was reappointed for a second five-year term. In 2019, he also became president of the Australasia and the Pacific region of the International Ombudsman Institute. Today, as we approach the 60th anniversary of the, of the Office of the Ombudsman in New Zealand, Peter will provide us with a reflection on its value and future. He will speak for 40 minutes and there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. I'll ask everyone to please use the chat function to ask the questions and I will be um, conveying those questions to Peter at the end of the presentation. Um, thanks very much. And Peter, the floor is yours. I gotta go. Nami hinui kia koutou katoa. Well, a very warm welcome to this session, and my aim is I hope you find it interesting and informative. So I've been asked to talk about our office, Kaitiaki Mana Tangata, Guardian of the Welfare of the People, Guardian the Mana of the People. And the topic is the value and future of the Office of the Ombudsman. So I'm going to take you through the development of our office, some of the work we do, and have a look at the future. Now, first of all, who are we? Well, we're an officer of parliament, uh, an independent watchdog, and this office was the first created outside of Scandinavia in uh, 1962. Now there on the screen, you see the very first ombudsman, Sir Guy Poles on the right, being sworn in by the then Governor General, Sir Bernard Ferguson. How different things were in those days. You can probably spy ladies wearing hats in the audience. And there is Sir Guy resplendent in his full wig and gown. Uh, I don't think I've even looked at a wig and gown since I've been in this job myself. Ombudsman's a word that comes from Scandinavia. It means an investigator, an inquisitor. But in fact, we find that the Māori, kaitiaki mana tangata, best really for me sums up um, the work that we do. Now, um, we've incorporated increasingly uh, te ao Māori into our, um, the way that the office operates. And in terms of fairness for all, Tuya Kia Oreti, we make that very much our extension to all New Zealanders. So I wanted to make sure that Tuya Kia Oreti, fairness for all, um, is seen as what we're here mostly for. Accountability really uh, comes at no cost. And um, it's fundamental that we do have accountability for checks and balances for all New Zealanders. And that's what the office is there to do. It's a check and balance to make sure that decisions affecting New Zealanders are reasonable and fair. And it's an access that New Zealanders have, um, which is free. And we'll talk a little bit more about the way we go about doing that. So the Ombudsman's role, well, firstly, it's to resolve and investigate complaints. That's really the very beginnings of the office in 1962 with a staff of about 16, that's all it did. Uh, it resolved, it got and resolved complaints. And this is still a large part of our work under the Official Information Act, the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act, and also the Ombudsman Act. So a large, large part um, of our work. 
In addition to that, though, we're increasingly involved in receiving protected disclosures, much more, of course, better known as whistleblowing inquiries. But I'll talk a little bit further uh, when I deal with some of these topics specifically about the sort of work we do with protected disclosures. Then the third major aspect of our work <clears throat> is to monitor and inspect places of detention. Probably some of our better known high profile work, and we commonly call it OPCAT. So I'll be developing with you a bit about this and some of it's extremely current, like MIQ facilities, which are much in the media these days. Then we do undertake our own systemic self-initiated investigations as well. Uh, we've done some important ones uh, going right back to consequences of the Christchurch earthquake and more recently those with intellectual disabilities and what we've had to say about the Ministry of Health's stewardship role. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the breadth of our role, we are the monitors for yet another UN convention um, called the Rights of People with Disabilities Convention. And we and two other bodies are designated by the government to monitor and advise on whether those who have disabilities under the convention are receiving a fair go. Applying the law, and I'm conscious that there will be many lawyers participating in this, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how I see the role. I have to say to you that before I took on this position of Chief Ombudsman, I knew very little about what an Ombudsman did. Like a lot of you, I was brought up with conventional common law uh, and statutory law. Um, in many ways, I've discovered that the sort of work we do is actually very akin to a form of judicial review, and I'll explain really what uh, I mean by that. The first thing, though, is, is this, that I get a complaint, and as I'll indicate in a minute or two, we triage that and make sure that we've got jurisdiction. Um, but, but once we have, we can look at it in terms of investigating the right outcome uh, outside of the ambit of strict pleadings, which courts, of course, rely upon to get from the beginning to the end. And so in that respect, it's quite a broader role. I can start off by considering that there is an issue which I think is unreasonable or unfair, and that will lead me to look at other aspects associated that, with that, which I think equally need my attention. So it's really quite uh, a broad role. What I'm required to do is to apply the law to the circumstances and make sure the outcome is fair. What do I mean by this statement? Um, look, I, I found at times, sitting as a judge, whatever I felt the right outcome was, if there wasn't the evidence and on a burden of proof, um, the, the applicant or um, the prosecution couldn't prove, then that was the end of it. I had no right myself to go looking uh, and go hunting for what might be the evidence to produce a fair outcome. Here, it, it's much more inquisitorial. And so I do ask for a whole lot of information myself. Uh, that comes and we go through an enormous assessment process. So the, the outcome I most want to be fair, even if the person doesn't get what they want, I want them to feel that in the process that we've undertaken, to inquire and to involve them in the process, I want them to feel um, that they have been listened to. Um, it's sometimes asked of me, well, what really force can you have, after all, in judicial review and a number of prerogative writs? The courts can be very prescriptive uh, and contempt can flow if a decision of the court's not adhered to. Uh, the ombudsman can't do that. In some countries of the world, by the way, they've decided that they will convert an ombudsman recommendation into a civil law remedy for enforcement. Most of us don't. 
The interesting thing is, I have to say that of the six years nearly that I've had in this job, it's very rare for a recommendation once made not to be followed through on, not to be implemented. So although there's strictly speaking, not a cons uh, um, coercive element by me requiring, in fact, I find mostly because I think agencies don't particularly want the bad publicity, most of the time, the recommendations we make are seen through to implementation. I'd like to talk a little bit about complaint resolution and how we go about this. So I've already said that we handle and resolve complaints under both the Official Information Act and the Ombudsman Act. I am allowed to use these two acts a bit interchangeably, which is very helpful. So the Official Information Act, which all of you will know about, uh, sets out three, in essence, important principles. One, information should be increasingly available to allow participation in democracy. Secondly, to promote accountability by those who spend the public money. And the third important principle is where the release of information should be protected for a host of reasons, it will be protected. So those are the, the three major things about the Official Information Act. Sometimes I need to go digging myself and I'm allowed to use my pretty broad powers under the Ombudsman Act to find out what I need to, to arrive at a proper, reasonable uh, decision under the Official Information Act. So there is that um, ability. Just recently, to remind you of some cases we've done that have attracted a bit of attention. First of all, the Taihapi uh, Area School. Uh, years ago, when the school owned the land, it was taken by the Ministry of Education for a purpose, not used and not returned. And in fact, uh, the land has been appropriated by the Crown for other reasons. We had an investigation into this and decided that this was unfair and unreasonable. Now, we weren't able to order the return of the land. Uh, even a court's ability would, on the facts, be quite difficult uh, the way things have evolved. But we were able to say, this is wrong, you should apologize, and you need to make some remedy available to the school, and at least they have now the ability to use the farm uh, for their own school purposes. Not everyone thinks, by the way, that's enough. Then the next one, McLean's College, this is one we did in the last month. Uh, I decided that the expulsion of a student who swore at a teacher, and there was a problem with the iPad, um, the particular child was upset and was inclined to be the sort of child who got upset over things like this. And threw um, a bit of a tantrum and smacked the iPad pad down and swore at the teacher and was expelled. We found that was unreasonable for a couple of reasons, or well, three really. One, the process wasn't uh, fair. Secondly, it was disproportionate. And thirdly, the school hadn't followed the Ministry of Education's own guidelines. Just a third one that I've done in the last two months, and this is MIQ related, uh, something giving rise to a lot of our work at the moment. Uh, look, someone came into New Zealand and had to go into quarantine, and their person's dogs, that person's dogs, also went into quarantine, and that's managed by MPI, who in turn contract it out to a provider. In fact, during the time, the dogs were poorly looked after. And by the time uh, the dog owner got out of quarantine and saw the dogs, they were not in a happy state. Uh, there was a complaint to us that there'd been a lack of standard of care, and we upheld that complaint. Uh, said in a number of recommendations that there should be uh, an excrash of payment to the dog owner to try and get the dogs remediated, rehabilitated. There should be an apology and there should be a process to make sure um, that this didn't happen again. Now, lately, there has been a lot said about MIQ complaints. 
And a little later, I want to just tell you where we're at with these, uh, because it's one of the most far reaching aspects offending, um, affecting New Zealanders right now. Now, under the Official Information Act and the Local Government uh, Act, a couple of things I just want to mention by way of high profile or really interesting official information complaints. Kiwi Rail was where a chief executive had prepared uh, a, 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 rep a report in draft. And the request was by a journalist to have this draft released. And the chief executive of Kiwi Rail thought that was fair enough. And often under the basis of no surprises, the chief executive consulted the then Minister of Transport. The minister's office got a hold of this and did not like this at all and gave a very clear message to the chief executive of Kiwi Rail that the minister would not look kindly upon this report being released. It became a bit clunky and gooey. The chief executive thought, crikey, so reversed his decision and decided not to release the report. He had previously said he would. There was a complaint by the Right Honourable Winston Peters to us, uh, which claimed ministerial interference and intervention. We investigated and found that there had not in fact been but what we did say was that the process followed had not been clean, and it was hardly surprising. Um, people challenged the integrity of what happened. Then last year, let's get Wellington moving. That was when the Minister of Associate Minister of Transport, Julianne Genta, had written to the Minister of Transport, Phil Twyford, um, and sought views and assurances about the Let's Get Wellington Moving project. Um, the letter that she wrote was requested by the National Party, Nicola Willis MP and one other. Um, this involved a lot of work because under the Official Information Act, when parties are in government together and in a coalition, the way in which parties must work and consult each other is subject to a specific protection under the Official Information Act. So we went backwards and forwards on this and decided that this really was a matter of a minister communicating with another minister. Uh, but we said that in the public interest, there should be a summary given of what was asked of the Minister of Transport by Julianne Genta and the essence of what the response was. Um, the the nine I Paul, I just put that in because I thought there was a, this was odd actually. A councillor asked the appropriate city council, um, Lower Hutt, for documents. The documents were given, but with a cost for making those documents available. And there was a complaint to us. I thought it was a strange thing for a council to be doing charging one of its own city councillors for the release of documents. And it wasn't as if this was a huge amount of work. Uh, so we reversed the, or recommended reversal uh, of the decision to charge. And then finally, and undoubtedly one of the most interesting ones that I've done, when the uh, Labour got into government on the first occasion, there were coalition talks to enable that to occur with New Zealand first. And so uh, a lot of negotiating occurred and some of you with long memories will remember what this sort of thing involves. The National Party then sought under the Official Information Act release of all of the coalition drafting documents. So what happens in this case, and it's why the Chief Ombudsman is required to maintain a top secret security clearance, I get all the information and in a fairly secret, safe setting, I look at everything and I decide together with my advisors what I believe the information in front of me discloses. Um, now, in relation to this one, information is official information if, for instance, it's created by a minister in that minister's official position. This occurred at a time when ministers had not been appointed they were still in discussion about the formation of government. So I found 
that the documents concerned were not by definition official information and that there was no need to disclose them. So this slide tells you a little bit about the timeliness of complaints. When I started, we had a substantial backlog of files. I think generated hugely by the uh, Christchurch earthquake. And I felt people were waiting too long. I felt the staff were burdened. I saw us writing a lot of correspondence, having to apologize for not having got on with things. So I said to my staff, will you buy in to me having a fairly clear, almost rigid structure wherein we will complete X amount of work by a certain time. So you'll see here that I require um, my work to be completed according to this pyramid. And what I'm achieving at the moment is 72% within three months, 82% within six months, and 93% within 12 months. Um, and so I am holding the ground, notwithstanding a large influx of complaints, pretty well. This slide tells you as to how we go about our work. So if you start off logically, number one, we receive a complaint. We're becoming more and more flexible as to how that complaint is received. And it could be one of a number of ways, including a voice message. I'm really keen on triage. I decided as principal family court judge when I ran that court that without a triage and assessment process, uh, if we put everything into the same pipeline, we would never survive. So we have an assessment and triage model here and decide just how difficult something is and how much time uh, should be given to it. Then you'll move around to resolution. And I have to endeavor to resolve most of my complaints by early resolution. I would never ever survive if we investigated everything. And early resolution works quite often um, under say an Ombudsman Act case, if I uh, get hold of the agency concerned and say, will you have another look at this? Something doesn't seem quite right. Often they will agree to do it. Under the Official Information Act, sometimes it's easy to broker. I'll call it a deal, but I don't want that to sound um, obscure. Sometimes what someone wants hasn't been made very clear. And equally, the agency hasn't got the right end of the story. And sometimes by negotiating, one comes up for the requester with exactly what they want. Now, if that doesn't work, we then go into a formal investigation process. And that is that is formal. It um, is, first of all, secret. And secondly, it gives me quite wide range and coercive powers, such as the power of search and uh, requiring people to answer questions on oath if required. Mostly just knowing that that's there and having the ability um, is enough. So then we gather information and I said right at the beginning, we do that. People will give us a certain amount, but we then go to the agency and quite often we will assemble a lot of information. So when I had a, a complaint from Nikki Hagar over Operation Burnham, this is all public, um, we considered 6,000 documents relating to the Afghanistan war uh, and information he wanted to test that had been provided by the New Zealand Defence Force. So that took ages to go through and assess all of that information. Now, the next thing we do is quite different to a court. I'm down the bottom now at number seven. I do a provisional opinion, and that's then given to the affected party for comment. Uh, so quite different to a judge giving a draft judgment to a litigant to see what they think. Quite different. And, and I do that for a number of reasons. One is to make sure that we haven't missed anything. And secondly, to give the person an idea of my thinking in the event that they've got something else that they want to say. They're sort of warmed up, if you like, to the course that we're looking at. And then we go to final opinion. And once that has been done, then that brings the matter to an end, to use that Latin expression, functus officio. So in the last year, this slide just gives you some stats about how busy we are. By the way, we have a staff now of about 170. 
uh, we occupy a building on the terrace in Wellington and also a building in Shortland Street in Auckland. So you'll see more than 12,600 matters completed in the last year. And that slide just gives you an idea when you look across the top um, at the composition of that work. If you then go to the, the pie graph, 91% clearance rate, it's not 100%, which I would have liked, simply because of the impact of COVID. Um, we are literally inundated with complaints by people very unhappy about the exercise of powers under COVID, as you might expect. So we now have a lot of work coming in. But all the same, you'll see that um, with the slide, four in every complaints resolved before final opinion. Now, we'll just go on to something completely different and look at OPCAT inspections. OPCAT stands for the Optional Protocol of Crimes Against Torture. So the Crimes Against Torture is a UN convention. It's a pretty gruesome sounding name, but what it really means is the right to humane detention. That's what it is. And the optional protocol means you will agree to do it in a way according to a protocol um, which has been established. So you, you accede to the treaty, and then if you're going to implement it, you can do it according to a protocol which has been uh, set up, and that's really what it means. Um, this, this is a unique function for me because it's a preventative mechanism. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at a prison and saying, in order for abuses to not occur, will you please remediate in the following way? So I'm not resolving a complaint. I'm not saying of my own volition, I'm going to look at your prison and see what I think of the whole thing. It's a preventative mechanism to stop in the future um, breaches of the Crimes Against Torture Act occurring, and if they are, to try and stop them continuing. So what this involves is the monitoring and inspection of places of detention, prisons, mental health units, aged care facilities, and now managed isolation and quarantine facilities. I have a staff of 30. I have two teams. Uh, we have a schedule and we go out, we look at prisons throughout the country and we do it mostly unannounced, but some are announced. During lockdown levels four and three last year, all of our visits were announced because I felt they had to be. Um, but a lot of our work is also mental health units. Uh, we've grown into more recently aged care, dementia units, and then MIQ, which is, of course, as you can see, with all the facilities operating, people are in detention, no doubt about that. So I'd like to now develop the aged care inspections program because this is new. In 2018, the Minister of Justice announced my OPCAT mandate uh, and that it would extend to privately owned aged care facilities. So why is this? Well, some of you will have loved ones or people you know in a, a dementia care facilities in aged care homes. And they are not free to leave. Often uh, they're either locked in the ward or the circumstances are such that they cannot exercise freedom to leave. And so by definition, they are in detention. We were going to be slower in our development of this. It was our first foray into the aged care sector. And we wanted to start very carefully by looking at orientation visits, getting used to what uh, this involved, working with um, private commercial bodies, something we haven't been used to. And we were going to start our visits in July of this year. But because of COVID and the fact that in levels three and four, loved ones couldn't get into aged care facilities to see those in there, we decided to bring um, our program forward. So we've made a lot of strides in this. We began a, a full aged care inspection program in June of this year. Last year, much more thematic 
uh, and circumspect and certainly um, announced. But now we are becoming um, more and more usual in the way we undertake this work. Uh, and it's a big and important part of our work. By the way, whoops, just one thing to say for, again, for lawyers, it's not always clear that someone in an aged care facility and in detention has the legal documentation to support that detention. So whereas in prisons, mental health units, it's reasonably straightforward with warrants and orders, uh, sometimes one's scratching to find documentation to justify someone being in an aged care facility and being detained, something that we keep a close eye on. Now let's get on to MIQ and border related complaints. So look at this number, more than 800 complaints about MIQ border and managed isolation allocation system uh, since July of last year. And of course, we've had to act with agility to move our staff to be able to keep up with numbers. So what sort of work um, does this involve? Well, um, some of you may have well been in an MIQ facility, and now there is a fee that you must pay, but you can apply for a waiver in certain circumstances. Very, very strict criteria. And if complainants feel that it's not been a fair process by MB, they complain to us. Then a number do not want to go into MIQ. They might say that they have already been vaccinated, they can offer to self-isolate uh, in a secluded part of New Zealand, so they apply for um, an exemption. Again, very strict criteria. Visa status, well, amongst other things, our government has said that there are four countries um, which have high, I'll say security or danger levels for possible introduction of COVID-19 into New Zealand. And so it is that, that unfortunately and sadly, a number of people, couples, are separated because they have a different status as far as New Zealand is concerned. One might be a permanent resident and one might not. And for some of the countries of high risk, they don't succeed in getting a visa to come into New Zealand at the moment. I have to tell you, this part of our work is, is pretty sad. And a number of people we deal with um, are increasingly upset at the way things are managed. I have 10 minutes to go and want to just increase the pace uh, a little. So MIQ and border related complaints, I told you a wee bit about. Uh, I'd said that we had more than um, 800 complaints. And I've also said that those relate to those areas of MIQ exemptions and visa soon. Um, we will do a thematic report um, on what we are seeing in the quarantine and managed facilities. Now, a completely different topic, and that is our uh, self-initiated um, investigation work. We've done a number of reports. Hetaki ko hukihuki. We looked into the operation of Oranga Tamariki. This was, I think, a seminal report. We clinically looked at 92 cases and uniformly found that Oranga Tamariki uh, had breached the law uh, and good practice by applying without notice in circumstances where they should have applied on notice and done it earlier. And this report, I think, has been heavily influential in considerable change now occurring within Oranga Tamariki. Um, then we found in prisons that tie down beds were being used, and I could talk for some time about this, but I remember when I was first shown the video of a prisoner with no clothes being bundled into a room by the prison officers, bundled in, no clothes, put on a bed, then a blanket thrown over him and restrained at the uh, feet, ankles, hands, torso. And that particular prisoner for 36 consecutive days, 16 hours a day. And we decided we would tackle the question of use of tie-down beds 
in corrections facilities. The end result of our report is that these beds are now banned. Then we get on to our local government inspection work. I again just want to mention this in passing. Um, this is our proactive work where we go in and ask local bodies uh, how they think they are doing in terms of compliance with the Local Government Official and Information Meetings Act. Disclosure. Um, again, I have to say a really interesting process. This was the Christchurch earthquakes and consequence. And the Ministry of Education decided it would set about closing some schools. So it embarked on a consultation process with the community. At the same time, we found the Ministry of Education was advising Cabinet and Cabinet was giving decisions back to the Ministry of Education, which weren't being shared with this tramline consultation uh, with the community. And we found that the process of, of supposed consultation with the community with a view to getting their feedback was in fact disingenuous. Finally, just recently, those with intellectual disabilities, I think you know, those of you who are involved in criminal law, there's the Criminal Procedure Mentally Impaired Persons Act and the IDCCR Act, the, the, the sort of companion acts. And we found that the facilities being operated for those, um, and about 220 a year, were under-resourced, inadequate, and poorly overseen and run by the Ministry of Health. And we said that their stewardship left a lot to be desired. Uh, then we've started to investigate corrections and we take the view that a number of recommendations we've made in relation to our reports dealing with corrections have not been implemented. And, and I've wanted to ask, what is it culturally about corrections that makes it so difficult to change. I'd like this to be a report which will have a lasting impact for New Zealanders. So this is a big investment by me. Uh, it won't be a report that will be finished before the end of next year. And I hope at the end of it, we've set out a platform for corrections to be able to change. Yet another change, disability rights. Well, um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities sets out the rights that people have, and we are part of that convention. And what they've done with the Ombudsman is make us a formal part of monitoring, and they call us together with the Human Rights Commission and the Disabled People's Coalition. We're called the Independent Monitoring Mechanism. So we do quite a lot here. I have a team that specializes during the pandemic lockdowns four and three, uh, we issued a report making disability rights real. And look, we said things which we hoped would help the government for the future, particularly the Ministry of Health in making sure that access to uh, websites and information that needed to be given um, was done in a way good for disabled people. Now, to be fair, uh, you probably would have been impressed, as I was, at the fact that in briefings, when the Prime Minister and the Director General of Health started telling us about the pandemic, uh, there was always a sign language interpreter present. So I think really um, it, it's gone very well in that respect, but some changes are needed. And finally, um, I have engaged a disability advisory panel um, to help me get insights into what really matters for people with disabilities in New Zealand. Now we come to just a, la a, a few last topics, protected disclosures or whistleblowing. I think this received uh, its prominence in the Ministry of Transport, Joanne Harrison incident. And just to remind you, Joanne Harrison was a fraudster and has been convicted of fraud and a very sophisticated fraudster. Some within the Ministry of Transport sniffed that she was up to no good. They began to drop this message and began to want to say the seniors need to be looking into this. Joanne Harrison in turn got onto this, so she succeeded in bringing 
redundancies uh, up and promptly. And a lot of those who were concerned about her exited the Ministry of Transport. A report was commissioned by the Public Service Commissioner, written by Sandy Beatty, and it said that the whistleblowers had been treated very badly and an apology was given um, and obviously some compensation. So we, we provide guidance to potential whistleblowers. A lot of people are very apprehensive about spilling the beans because they're worried about retribution and the effect on their career. We review and guide public sector agencies in investigations, and we have specialists here who under the Act are especially designated uh, to help give advice. And finally, we do ourselves receive and investigate disclosures of serious wrongdoing, or we refer them on. And I have um, been at the table when seniors have come in from an agency and have said, I wish to make a protected disclosure to you. I have in front of me a hoard of information. Will you protect me if I give it to you and tell you about it? And I say, yes, and I have. So that's protected disclosures. I do think that there's a lot more about the work of the Ombudsman that needs to be better known. What we've done with the Media Freedom Committee, uh, this is a, a heavy hitting body of top media outlets and senior uh, media people. And they came to me and said, what, what can we do to try and get the Official Information Act working in a more seamless fashion? So we set to and devised a guide, I call it a cheat sheet. And the reason for that is it's a one page laminated guide that we felt all journos through the country could be given and it could sit on their desk and they could look at it and be better informed of the next step that they needed to take. And uh, we've given that increasingly to agencies. So what I'm trying to do is to make the Ombudsman Act and the Official Information Act more accessible to New Zealanders. It's still work in progress. It's still a tense situation at times between where the balance is. Uh, I do want to say this, and I, I believe it and want to nail my colours to the mast. I do think that uh, transparency in open information, tomorrow, by the way, is um, Right to Information Day. It does contribute to a transparent and good democracy. And so we're very committed in my office to seeing to the best po possible extent that we can get the Official Information Act working correctly. I sense I have less than five minutes a bit on the international work. New Zealand, although we're small, has a very high profile with the international community. Um, and what this really amounts to is this. Uh, my predecessor, Dame Beverly Wakeham, was the president of the International Ombudsman Institute. About 170 bodies, mostly countries throughout the world belong. Uh, I'm presently the regional president of the Australasian Pacific Ombudsman region and a lot of my work is working with the international community, but particularly in the Pacific here, to help those ombudsman officers with the firepower we've got. So just finally, the International Ombudsman Institute is a, a very significant body um, housed in Vienna and all paid for by the Austrian government. And I am deeply in admiration of the international work that it does. Now, just finally, I want to spend three minutes on Te Tiriti o Waitangi. I pause because of the importance and the seriousness of this issue. I do not feel um, that until more recent times, uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi has been correctly seen in its perspective. And I therefore wanted my office to challenge itself on operating in a way, te ha Māori, which was fair to the treaty partners. Now, we are not the Crown. We are not the Crown. So I'm not bound by the Treaty of Waitangi Act. But I want to make sure that with practices and decisions that are made by the Crown, those practices and decisions are consistent 
with the treaty. And it therefore means that when a complainant is one of the treaty partners, we must have regard to the treaty itself. So it follows that increasingly, when we have a complainant who is Māori, the treaty will be at the heart of the reviews and the investigations that we undertake. You'll see a photograph here. I won't go through all of the names, but um, these are my uh, advisory board members, Puhara Manatangata, and I have got representatives of iwi here from um, Tamaki Makaurau down to Naitahu. And so this panel has been, frankly, one of the most rewarding and one of the best things that I have done in my time here. I just want to sum up where I'm at with Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and that is fairness for all, not just fairness for some, and the way the Crown feels fairness should be delivered. We now uh, regard ourselves as having the right to look afresh and see whether there has in fact been um, that degree of fairness. Now, the last um, second to last slide, contributing to a, uh, to a democracy, I'm going to move through very speedily. There is a Transparency International uh, Perception of Corruptions Index. We're first in the world equal, and we always are right at the top there. And the question is, what's important about this and why? And it's because if you do have integrity and people trust you, what you say influences. And people don't try and second guess why you're saying something. I think they trust that you've done it for the right reason. So if we're going to stay at the top of the table, it needs constant action and attention. Now I'm going to finish with the future that was I was asked to do. Next year is the 60th anniversary of our Ombudsman Office. And fortunately, we have an independence and a financial model that ensures the Ombudsman in New Zealand has integrity and security. I know that my effectiveness and the effectiveness of my office will only survive and become enhanced if I retain my credibility and my independence. So we're fundamental to New Zealand's constitutional framework. And I mean that, I don't say that lightly. I think we are crucial uh, when it comes to checks and balances. And I'd like to feel that the reason that our work's expanded and that during my five years, nearly six, that we've been given much more work by the parliament is because we're trusted in what we do and we are felt worthwhile investing in. So that's a good note to finish on. Wellington Harp doesn't quite look like that today, but um, it often does. And I now welcome any questions you might have on matters that um, I've raised. Thanks very much uh, for that, Peter. That was extremely interesting and, and informative. I particularly appreciated the way in which you explained the functions of the office by reference to recent examples, um, as well as your comments about the importance of the office from a democratic perspective. And, and I was also impressed by, both by the number of complaints you deal with and by the rate they are um, resolved. We now have around um, 10 minutes um, for questions. As noted at, at the beginning, um, please use the, the chat function to, to ask any questions you, you, you may have, and, and I'll convey them to, to um, Peter. Yes, um, so we have, we have a question here from, from um, Dean Knight, um, associate professor here at the, at the Faculty of, of Law. Um, he says, um, you compared your maladministration work to, the, to judicial review, especially the more inquisitorial freedom you have. However, you noted that otherwise your inquiries follow the form of judicial review and the examples of intervention tend to echo the established grounds of review at common law. That is, we see little reliance on the wrongness and other merits-based grounds available under your legislation. And then there are two, two um, questions. Um, first is a move to narrower law process standards, deliberate and reflective of your general approach. And second, is some of the virtue of ombuds relative to the court's 
lost um, if that is so. Um, Dean, uh, always expect a profound and insightful question from you. I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I have got the full grip of the question. Um, look, look, can I can I answer what I, I think you're you're saying? Please forgive me if I haven't got a full grip on what, in fact, you're asking. Um, Mostly, I draw the comparison between judicial review and what I do because it's reasonableness. It's a question of has the task been undertaken conscientiously and is the process followed reasonable? Um, I may not agree with the decision that uh, the agency has made, but I, but I do not seek to disturb it because I feel that I have a different view. So if a decision arrived at was reasonably arrived at it was open to the decision maker then even if to the person they may feel that it's unfair i don't have the ability to say it's unfair unless there have been some disturbances with process now i um i hope i've got that correctly when i i look at wrongfulness by the way if i can just mention this i'm doing things such as I look at a decision maker's record and process. I actually look and to see what they've recorded and who they've spoken to. And if I feel that I can't follow it and there is no basis that I can see for their reasoned process, then I ask them to either supply it to me and if they can't, I ask them to do it again. So I hope that's an answer to your question. I fear it might not be not quite on the mark. And um, so next question, yes. Yes, so um, I do have here a couple of questions. So, so I'll ask um, this one from, um, I think it's, um, well, I cannot see the name um, there, but um, the question is, um, do you think public service employees have a good understanding of the OIA 1982 and its principles? If not, what in your view can be done to remedy this? I. It's a very good question. I don't think there is uh, as much of an understanding as, as I think there should be. And by the way, I don't think it's just agencies. I think some ministers' offices and those who are political advisors do not have the, the requisite degree of knowledge either. What can be done about this? Well, look, we're trying to do as much as we can in our outreach work by educating, doing webinars, talking, uh, we're now much more active on our website in the guides that we have and questions that can be asked on really what's quite a almost an interactive website. Um, I would personally like to feel that all chief executives have as part of their key performance indicators a requirement that their agencies will comply with the Official Information Act. Now that may seem simple, but if we were to make that a KPI, it may just encourage some chief executives to ensure staff get the sort of training on the OIA that I bet you they get in relation to other aspects of their work. I hope that helps. Thanks very much. And I have here a question from um, Professor Claudia Geiringer. Um, Claudia says, um, do you believe that at a conscious and explicit level, your office has any role in policy and compliance with the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act? I appreciate that there will be areas of overlap with some of your explicit functions, such as the OPCAT, but um, one of my interests or my interest is whether you regard yourself as having any more explicit role. Um, look, look, you're dead right. Uh, most of uh, Claudia, and, and thank you for participating and for your question. Look, most of the human rights work is in OPCAT and disability rights. Um, but, but in relation to um, other aspects of the work, we do have regard to the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, which, which is so fundamental in rights that people have. So it, it is, yes, one of the factors that we consider under both the Official Information Act, that is, rights that people have must have a basis in the Bill of Rights Act. But I'd have to say from a human rights perspective, the vast majority of the work human rights based is disability and aged care, mental health, those raft of rights that, that I think we are keenly looking out for and seeing are observed. 
Thanks very much. And if I may add this um, from, from Claudia, um, she says, and perhaps I should add, do you have any views on the concrete implications for you of being covered by Section 3 of the Bill of Rights? Um, she says, not trying to put you on the spot here, just interested in whether any thoughts, any thought has been given to this. Um, I haven't given any thought to it for the purpose of an answer right now, Claudia. Happy to look at that and have a good think about it offline, but you won't thank me for diving into this um, when I'm not probably as clinical as I should be. So I will have a look at that and always interested in absorbing and reforming views. Thanks very much. I have here a question from Jonathan Scrag, and, and I think this is probably the last question I'll be able to, to, um, to read. So um, uh, Jonathan says, Peter, thank you for a highly informative session. As chief ombudsman, are you involved in all of the office's projects or do you delegate to a number of deputy ombudsmen uh, around New Zealand? A, a good question. So um, there are a number of ombudsmen in New Zealand, some of whom were appointed for historical purposes, like the banking ombudsman and the financial services ombudsman. I am the only parliamentary ombudsman. The Act allows for up to four ombudsmen, one of whom must be the chief ombudsman. The model I have here is that I go it alone as the ombudsman, mostly to give consistent direction within the office. I have a deputy ombudsman, I have four assistant ombudsmen, and then of course a whole lot of staff. I give explicit delegations according to how I want the work done. The law requires an ombudsman to sign off any final opinion. Before that, I can delegate as much as I want to, depending on the complication, the seriousness, and how quickly I want things done. So it's in some ways a business. I do things at the top, which clearly need the chief ombudsman's view and intervention, but a lot of queries that come in don't need my personal attention. Thanks very much, um, Peter, and apologies for those whose questions I wasn't able to, um, to read out. Um, we have reached the end of the event, um, but before we go, I wanted to thank Peter again for this really, really excellent lecture, and also to thank you for your questions and comments. Remember to keep an eye on our website for future events. Um, kia ora. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.